Chapter 1, One of Us Was Lying. Cooper, Monday, September 24th, 3 or 5 p.m. My hand hurts within minutes. It's pathetic, I guess. I can't remember the last time I wrote anything longhand. Plus, I'm using my right hand, which never feels natural no matter how many years I've done it. My father insisted when I learned to write right-handed in second grade after he saw my first pitch. Your left arm's gold, he told me. Don't waste it on crap that don't matter. Which is anything but pitching as far as he's concerned. That was when he started calling me Cooperstown. Like the baseball hall of fame. Nothing is like putting a little pressure on an eight-year-old. Simon reached for his backpack and roots around, unzipping every section. He hoisted it onto his lap and peers inside. Where the hell is my water bottle? No talking, Mr. Keller. Mr. Avery says without looking up. I know, but my water bottle's missing and I'm thirsty. Mr. Avery points to the sink in the back of the room. It's counter crowded with beakers and petri dishes. Get yourself a drink quietly. Simon gets up and grabs a cup and the stack on the counter, filling it with water from the tap. He heads back to his seat and puts the cup on his desk, but seems distracted by Nate's methodical writing. Dude, he says, kicking his sneakers against the leg of Nate's desk. Seriously, did you put those phones in our backpacks to mess with us? Now Mr. Avery looks up, frowning. I said quietly, Mr. Keller. Nate leans back and crosses his arms. Why would I do that? Simon shrugs. Why would you do anything? So you have company for whatever you screw up of the day was? One more word out of either of you needs detention tomorrow, Mr. Avery warns. Simon opens his mouth anyway, but before he can speak, there's a sound of tires squealing and the crash of two cars hitting each other. I gasp and I brace myself against the desk like somebody just rear-ended me. Nate, who looks glad for it, the interruption, is the first one on his feet towards the window. Who gets the fender bender in the school parking lot, he asks. Bronwyn looks at Bronwyn looks at Mr. Avery and she's asking for permission. When and when he gets up from his desk he heads to the window as well. Addie follows her, and I finally unfold myself from the seat. Might as well see what's going on. I lean against the ledge to look outside, and Simon comes up beside me with a disp despairingly laugh. He as he surveys the scene. Two cars, an old red one and a nondescript gray one, are smashed into each other at a right angle. We stare at them in silence, and Mr. Avery lets out an exasperated sigh. I better make sure no one is hurt. He runs his eyes over the, over us and zeroes in on Bronwyn, the most responsible of the bunch. Miss Rojas, keep this room contained until I get back. Okay, Bronwyn says, casting a nervous glance towards Nate. As we stay, stay at the window watching the scene below, but Mr. Avery where another teacher appears outside. Both cars start their engine and drive out of the parking lot. Well, that was anticlimactic, Simon says. He heads back to his desk and picks up, picks up the cup. But instead of sitting, he wanders to the front of the room and scans the periodic table of elements poster. He leans out into the hall like he's about to leave, but then he turns and raises his cup like he's toasting us. Anyone else want some water? I do, Addie says, slipping into a chair. Get it yourself, princess, Simon smirks. Addie rolls her eyes and stays why stays put while Simon leans against Mr. Avery's desk. Literally, huh? What will you do with yourself now that homecoming's over? Big gap between now and senior prom. Addie looks at me without answering. I don't blame her. Simon's train of thought almost never goes anywhere good when it comes out comes to our friends. He acts like he's above caring whether he's popular, but he's pretty smug when he wound up on the junior prom court last spring. I'm still not sure how he pulled that off unless he traded keeping secrets for votes. Simon was nowhere to be found on homecoming court last week, though. He was voted- I was voted queen. King. So maybe I'm next on his list to harass or whatever the hell he's doing. What's your point, Simon? I ask, taking a seat next to Addie. Addie and I aren't close exactly, but I kind of feel protective of her. She's been dating my best friend since freshman year, and she's a sweet girl. Also, it's not the kind of person who knows how to stand up for a guy like Simon who won't quit. Who just won't quit. She's a princess and you're a jock, he says. He thrusts his chin towards Bronwyn, then at me. And you're the brain, and you're the criminal. We're a walking teen movie stereotypes. What about you, Bronwyn asks. She's been hovering near the window, but now goes to her desk and perches on top of it. She crosses her legs and pulls her dark ponytail over the shoulder. Something about her is cuter this year. New glasses, maybe? Longer hair? All of a sudden, she's kind of working the sexy nerd thing. I'm the ominous, omniscient narrator. 
princess bronze brows raised above her black frames. There's no such thing as in teen movies. Ah, oh, but Bronwyn suddenly winks and chugs his water in one gulp. There is such a thing in life. He says it like a threat, and I wonder if he's got something on Bronwyn for that stupid app of his. I hate that thing. Almost all my friends have been put on it at one point or another, and some sometimes it causes real problems. My buddy Luis and his girlfriend broke up because of something Simon posted, though it was a true story about Luis hooking up with his girlfriend's cousin, but still, that stuff doesn't have to be published. Published. Hallway gossip is bad enough, and if I'm being honest, I'm pretty freaked out what Simon could write about me if he puts his mind to it. Simon holds up his cup, grimacing. It tastes like crap. He drops the cup and I roll my eyes in an attempt at drama. Even when it falls to the floor, I still think he's messing around, but then the wheezing starts. Bronwyn's on her feet here, kneeling beside him. Simon, she says, shaking his shoulder. Are you okay? What happened? Can you talk? Her voice goes from concern to panicky, and that's enough to get me moving, but Nate's faster, shoving me and crouching next to Bronwyn. A pen? He says, his eyes scanning Simon's brick face. You have a pen? Simon nods wildly, his hand clawing at his throat. I grab the pen off my desk and try to hand it to Nate, thinking he's just about to do an emergency trick to me, trick me or something. Nate just stares at me like I have two heads. Ep an epinephrine pen, he says, searching for Simon's backpack. He's having an allergic reaction. Addie stands and wraps her arms around the body. He's not saying a word. Bronwyn turns to me, face flush. I'm going to find the teacher and call 911. Stay with him, okay? She grabs her phone out of Mr. Avery's drawer and runs to the hallway. She kneels to Simon. I kneel to Simon. His eyes are bugging out of his head. His lips are blue. He's making a horrible choking noise. Nate dumps the entire contents of Simon's backpack to the floor and scrambles through the mess of books, papers, and clothes. Simon, where do you keep it? He asks, tearing the small front compartment and yanking out two regular pens and a set of keys. Simon's way past talking, though. One, I put one sweaty palm on his shoulder. Like, that'll do any good. You're okay. You're gonna be okay. We're getting help. I can hear my voice slowing, thickening like mol molasses. My accents always come out hard when I'm stressed. I turn to Nate and ask, You sure he's not choking on something? Maybe he means a Heimlich maneuver, not a freaking medical pen. Nate ignores me, tossing Simon's empty backpack aside. He yells, slamming his fist on the floor. Do you keep it on you, Simon? Simon! Simon's eyes roll back in his head, and Nate digs around in Simon's pockets, but he doesn't find anything to keep a recalled Kleenex. Sirens, sirens blare in the distance as Mr. Avery and the two teachers race with Bronwyn, trailing behind them on her phone. We can't find his EpiPen, Nate says, tersely, gesturing to the pile of Simon's things. Mr. Avery stares at Simon in a slack jaw horror as the second and turns to me. Cooper, the nurse's office has EpiPens. They should be labeled in plain sight. Hurry. I run to the hallway, hearing footsteps behind me that fade. As I quickly reach the black stairwell and yank the door open, I take the stairs three at a time until I'm on the first floor, and I weave through the few straggling students to get to the nurse's office. The door's ajar, but nothing's there. It's a cramped little space with the exam table up against the windows and a big gray storage cabinet looming to my left. I scan the room, my eyes landing on two wall-mounted boxes with red block lettering. One reads emergency defibrillator and the other reads emergency epinephrine. I fumble on the latch for the second one and I pull it open. There's nothing inside. I open the other box, which has a plastic device with a picture of a heart. I'm pretty sure that's not it, so I start rummaging through the gray storage cabinet, pulling out boxes of bandages and aspirin. I don't see anything that looks like a pen. Cooper, did you find them? Mrs. Grayson, one of the teachers who entered the lab with Mr. Avery and Bronwyn, barrels into the room. She's panting hard and clutching her side. I gesture towards the empty wall-mounted box. They should be there, right? But they're not. Check the supply cabinet, Miss Grayson says, ignoring the band-aid boxes scattered across the floor that I prove already, I've already tried. Another teacher joins us. We tear the office apart as the sound of sirens gets closer. When we open the last cabinet, Miss Grayson wipes the tip trickle of sweat from her forehead and the back of her hand. Cooper, let Mr. Avery know we haven't found anything yet. Mr. Contis and I will keep looking. I get to Mr. Avery's lab the time the paramedics do. There are three of them in navy uniforms, two pushing long right stretcher, one racing ahead of it to clear the small crowd that's gathered around the door. I wait until they're all outside to slip in behind them. 
Mr. Avery slumped to the, next to the chalkboard, his yellow dress shirt untucked. We couldn't find the pins, I tell him. He runs a shaking hand through his white, thin white hair as one of the paramedics stabs Simon with a syringe and the other two lift him onto the stretcher. God help that boy, he whispers, more to himself than to me, I think. Abby's standing off to the side herself, by herself, tears rolling down her cheeks. I cross over to her and put an arm around her shoulder as the paramedics maneuver Simon's stretcher into the hallway. Can you come along? One of us asks Mr. Avery. He nods and follows, leaving the room empty except for a few shell-shocked teachers and the four of us who stared, who started detention with Simon, barely 15 minutes ago, by my guess, and it feels like hours. Is he okay now? Addie asks in a strangled voice. Bronwyn clasps her phone between her palms like she's using it to pray. Nate stands with his hands on his hips, staring at the door as more teachers and students search going inside. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say no, he said.